The need for the hour in our culture today is men and women who are so familiar with the stories of God's deliverance, so captivated by the rehearsal of what they've heard God do time and again faithfully by his strong and outstretched arm that they are able to withstand the great evils and persecutions of our day and summon an even greater faith that the saints throughout the ages have done. Please turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. It's in the New Testament. It's near the end of the New Testament. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 13, but we'll be focusing on verses 1 through 3 and then verses 10 through 13. These are the words of God. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation to be revealed at the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you do not see him, Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the gift of your sacred writings, the scriptures. Your spirit moved as we heard Peter say, and your prophets heard and wrote. And you have kept what they wrote for us, and you are keeping your covenant promises. We pray that you would open our hearts to the immeasurable grace that comes to us by your word. Through Christ we pray. Amen. As we conclude our series on the holy habits, or spiritual disciplines as they're often called, we've been working through various aspects of the Christian life. Pastor Foster began this series a few weeks ago by laying out the basic foundation of what Christian living is as being done to please our Heavenly Father. So all of our spiritual disciplines, whether we do them in our homes, marriages, or personal lives, they're being done out of a position of knowing who our God is. They're not being done to earn God's favor. He then moved forward to specific areas of family worship and the habits that make for a godly marriage. And now we finally come to what most people think about when they think about spiritual disciplines. They usually think about just Bible reading and prayer. I think of this as now we've come to what I think of the core. It's like the engine room that keeps all of these other things going. We've addressed some aspects of Christian family, the habits of godly marriage, and now we've come finally to the individual, the self. Have we saved the best for last? Well, maybe. Or maybe we've just saved the most sensitive for last. I can think of no other subject that brings a greater amount of guilt and frustration to individual Christians than when they think about their own Bible reading and prayer. Countless times, each of us have set out on Bible in a year plans with unbridled optimism that comes with the new year. 
We immediately get our start in the green goodness of creation in Genesis. We see the wonder of God in the Exodus, but then most of us die off in what I like to think of the bewilderness of, the, of Leviticus. Ask any Christian, they are almost guaranteed to have walked this same road before, and like that generation, they died in the wilderness. So many of these failures, though, they can simply be chalked up to a misunderstanding of how habits are actually formed. I want to I focus this morning on the habits part of holy habits before we look at the, the reading of God's word. What we do when we do this is we spiritualize away all the practical wisdom that would actually help us to cultivate the habit. We mistakenly think that zeal and motivation for God will carry us beyond the limits of where our discipline and our our practice have already taken us. We expect daily perfection in reading God's word, but we start from a place of not even understanding what it is that we're attempting to do. We think that we're going to execute in the game, and we've never been to practice. We've never seen the game plan. And then we're overly crushed when we fail. I remember when I was a youth, I tried for my fifth grade basketball team, and I had not practiced the entire summer, but that morning I got up at 5 a.m., and I started doing free throws on our our back hoop. That's not the way to prepare, brothers and sisters, but that's often how we approach things like what we're going to talk about today in this sermon. Perhaps you'll recall just a few weeks ago, Pastor Foster quoted Donald Whitney, and he said, discipline without delight is drudgery. And that's exactly what happens to us, isn't it, when we fail to retain these habits. We attempt to cultivate a discipline, but eventually the value of the delight that we have is neglected, and in the face of the drudgery that inevitably comes, its pursuit is abandoned. But I want to say that this cycle need not define us. It is possible for you to learn the practical skills that are necessary to build habits in your life. And not only is it possible, but even the pagans can do these things. You see, Christians do not have a monopoly on the practical wisdom that is necessary for habit building. What is common for the championship athlete, for the solo violinist, for anyone who's ever learned a language, everyone who's ever acquired a skill or developed mastery in any aspect of life, what has happened for them is that they created a discipline which overcomes the drudgery by a delight that can be sustained. They somehow create a discipline that allows the delight to be sustained and they overcome the drudgery. What each of these successful people has done is they've framed their desire in a way to make that desired behavior more likely than uh, than succumbing to whatever obstacles come. Here's where the rubber meets the road, however. Obstacles are not predictable. Obstacles cannot be foreseen. You cannot create a contingency list for each eventuality that will come in the Christian life. So how do you respond to the inevitable obstacles that'll come? Well, what's more important than creating schedules or task lists that you'll accomplish is the cultivation of an identity. Those who succeeded at learning a new skill or achieving mastery or learning some language or becoming a championship athlete, they ultimately did this, and along the way they cultivated an identity. This identity that they cultivated had real signs of proof. And those who do this, they have an internal way of looking at their own lives that begins to define their desire, that their desired goals begin to fall in line with that identity. This is one of the central ideas, if you've ever heard of a book a very popular best-selling book by James Clear right now called Atomic Habits. We've, we've mentioned it before. James Clear talks about this in his book. Consider, for example, just for a moment, the idea of someone who wants to start exercising. Well, what James Clear advocates is creating an identity first and proving it to yourself by small wins. So instead of setting a goal to go to the gym three times a week, you first cultivate the mindset I am going to be a healthy person. And then after I am going to be, I am a healthy person. And then once you cultivate that idea, you begin to prove it by little small wins. So when the unforeseen obstacle arrives, when the dessert that you shouldn't eat arrives, when the, uh, when the sickness comes in that takes you out of getting to the gym three times that week, 
You overcome the unplanned obstacle by saying, no, this is how I'll respond. How would a healthy person respond? Now, before you go too far with this idea, I think that there's a limit here. But I think James Clear is actually, he's right about this idea. He's right about the identity-based habit. Keep in mind that all truth is God's truth. So I think James Clear is actually borrowing from a Christian understanding of the self, and uh, that's a subject for a later, later date, but James Clear is just simply borrowing on truth that is truth. If, if truth is truth, it is God's truth. So here, however, is where the difference comes between the pagan, the unbeliever, and what the Christian is able to do. For the Christian, his identity can't be manufactured. But rather, your identity as a Christian is the outworking of what God has done through Christ. But it's not so for the unbeliever. The one who is not of God doesn't care what God says, and thus can never develop a love for God's word, which is our subject this morning. However, this is where it is different from the Christian. The true child of God loves his father. He wants to please his father. And therefore, for the Christian... The Christian can come to love God's word. You can become a person who loves God's word. But like all aspects of sanctification, your love, your delight in God's word, your habit of reading God's word does not come automatically. It must be cultivated. For you to begin to love God, reading God's word, you must be convinced of two things, the value of what we have in God's word and the vitality of of reading God's word for your spiritual health. The value of what we have, the vitality of what it gives you in your life. If you are a Christian and you understand the tremendous value that you have in the Bible, you will begin to prioritize it because it will flow from your faith and your faith always has a way of working itself out. This will be the difference between your success and your failure as you seek to build a spiritual discipline of reading God's word. And that's exactly where we come today in today's text. The beginning of Peter's first epistle deals with these two great questions. What exactly is it that we have in God's word and what are we doing when we read God's word? So the two questions we're going to be examining from 1 Peter this morning again are, what is it that we have in God's word, and what are we doing when we read God's word? We see a glimpse of the value of what we have in God's word in the very opening of Peter's epistle, and it's the context behind his words that we're going to examine this morning. He said in his opening, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion. In Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And then in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. Now, who is Peter? Who is the one writing this letter? Well, Peter, as you may know, is an apostle of Jesus Christ. This means that Jesus commissioned Peter with an authoritative message to take into the nations about the forgiveness of sins and the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Peter was not just sent as a messenger, but he was an eyewitness of these things. And we know that Peter did exactly that. This letter is written to a particular group of Christians that it's very likely that Peter had already visited. Peter addressed this letter, as we heard, to the elect exiles of the dispersion. Now, this is where our biblical history, our knowledge of what we have in God's word, is so helpful for us to understand the significance of what Peter is saying. What was the dispersion that Peter is describing? Well, this requires us to actually survey the whole Bible. And unfortunately, uh, we won't have time to survey every part of the whole Bible, but I'll give you a summary of what I think Peter is saying when he's referring to the dispersion. God had chosen a people, Israel. He had pulled them out of Egypt and given them a great promised land. He had done this through signs and wonders and acts of grace and mercy, and he had invested in them his favor and his name. He had given them the law. He had given them the promised land. He installed them, as it says in his word, that he gave them vineyards they did not plant, houses they did not build. He gave everything to Israel, and yet Israel repeatedly broke God's covenant. And after breaking God's covenant, God sent 
prophet after prophet to warn and encourage them to return to God, and yet they refused the prophets. Jesus described the people of Israel as those who kill the prophets and stone those who God sends to her. And so finally, God in his mercy brought judgment upon his people. The people of Israel were carried off into exile, and they were dispersed in the nations. But even in the midst of this judgment, God's grace was displayed. He gave a promise that they would eventually, even though they have no reason in their own to do so, they would eventually return to the land. He would cause them to return, the temple would be built up again, and Israel would no longer wander away from God. He would cause them to return from exile. And indeed, we know that just 70 years after that exile happened, God kept his promise. I love how David mentioned this morning during worship, God is a covenant-making and a covenant-keeping God. God was faithful. We read about that return from exile in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. But if you read those books, you're left with an overwhelming sense at the end of those books. This ain't it. It says in Haggai that the glory of the latter house will be greater than the former house. But when we read in Ezra, when they laid the foundation and built the temple, the people who remembered the former temple wept because the temple that was being rebuilt was just a shadow of the former glory. So the question would be, did God keep the promise that he sent through Haggai? Well, that's exactly what Peter's writing about. You see, at the end of Ezra and Nehemiah, the exiles haven't fully returned The nation isn't fully reestablished. The kingdom isn't restored. There's no son of David sitting on the throne in Jerusalem. And in general, it's a pretty bleak picture. And so at the close of the writings, at the close of the Old Testament, as you read it, you're left with a massive number of open questions. The tribes are still scattered. The kingdom isn't reestablished. And the people are still turning away from worshiping God. When we get to the end of the Old Testament, we're left wondering, how is it that God is really going to bring about a true rescue for his people? Well, we who live after Jesus Christ's coming, death, and resurrection know exactly how he did that. That coming, that death and resurrection, was announced and begun on the day of Pentecost. On that day, devout Jews from all over the exiled nations had been returned, had regathered in Jerusalem. And those who were in Jerusalem that day are some of the very same nations that Peter is addressing in his epistle. If you compare the list of people who hear the mighty deeds of God in Acts chapter 2, and you compare who Peter is addressing his epistle to, they're some of the same nations. He mentions Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. After Christ was killed and raised during the Feast of Pentecost, God sent his Holy Spirit upon his church. And Peter stood up and proclaimed to those exiles who had returned what the true exile and return was, the death and resurrection and the proclamation of the forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ. Instead, however, of receiving the Messiah, the people of Israel added on to their their sins and crimes, the capstone sin of the ages, by rejecting the very anointed king that God sent and killing him. Rather, however, at this point, in unleashing greater judgment, God responds with mercy. He uses this great sin of Israel, his people, to accomplish their redemption. So when we hear Peter say that this letter is addressed to the elect exiles in the dispersion, what you should hear if you know the story is nothing less than the fact that God has fulfilled every one of his covenant promises to Israel. God has fully sent the Messiah into the world. And that Messiah didn't just come and establish an earthly kingdom. He established an eternal heavenly kingdom which does impact this earth, but doesn't end there, but will include, as Peter writes in his epistle, the saving of our souls. This Messiah not only gave up his life, atoned for sin, but he has defeated death. And because of that, we can walk in new life. God has overcome the spiritual waywardness of Israel, which caused her to go into exile. And now he has gathered his scattered people and at Pentecost now re-sent them out into the nations, 
to take that message of the gospel into the whole world. And not only that, he sent and commissioned the apostles to go chase down the nations which had been running from him ever since the beginning. That story, brothers and sisters, all that we rehearsed, that entire covenant history, indeed the reason for the whole world's existence, is what we have in the Bible. We don't just have stories that are inspired, that, that are intended to inspire tiny quiet times of personal devotions, the warm fuzzies, the nice feelings. No, we've been given the story of everything that God has done, and that's what we see in the scriptures. God's word is nothing less than a complete history of everything that he has done and said to display his covenant mercy on a worldwide and cosmic scale. God's word shows us his grace in the creation of making a world in which we can live in and enjoy him. God's word shows us his grace in the fall, that even after our first parents, Adam and Eve, rejected him at the tree, stealing from him instead of receiving with thankfulness, how he responded with a promise of mercy that would come, that there would be one who is the seed of the woman who would crush that serpent's head. God's word shows us in his extreme patience and forbearance, not just with the people of Israel, but with all the nations, all people everywhere who have rejected him. God's word shows us the excellencies of his mercy, not just sending in the Messiah to restore Israel, but to come get all the nations. And God's word shows us not just how he accomplished our salvation through Jesus Christ, but how that salvation is applied to us who take hold of it by faith, being preserved until that day. It is that salvation which is the common theme throughout all of God's word. And it is that salvation which the Holy Spirit revealed to the prophets all throughout Israel's history, which Peter declares as we come to our reading in verse 10, concerning this salvation, the salvation which is preserving and has returned these exiles to God, Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours, they searched and inquired carefully. They were inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. By the prophets who prophesied, Peter doesn't have in mind just who we commonly think of when we hear the term prophets, such as Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. But in, in fact, he includes, he has in mind the whole scriptures. When these exiles who were Jews, faithful Jews throughout the nations, when they read Peter's words, they would have understood Peter to be describing the scriptures. You see, Peter has in mind all of those who have prophesied about Christ. Consider for a moment Moses. Moses, we know, was a prophet, but he prophesied of a greater prophet to come. Moses heard from God as we read in Deuteronomy 18:18, 18, 18, God said to Moses, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. So Peter certainly has in mind the words of God through Moses and Moses' writings, the law. But continuing on after Moses... The books of Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings, those books that we know, we commonly think of them as histories, the Jews referred to them as the former prophets. You see, they understood the larger message that was in and around the writings. They understood what we simply think of as history as also foretelling of the need for a greater deliverer, a great king who would finally come. Peter says that all of these prophets, Moses, the, the former prophets, the prophets proper, all of these prophets searched and inquired very carefully. Now that search and inquiry, which Peter tells us to imitate, was not just a private searching of their own minds and hearts in the Holy Spirit through prayer. Hear what John Gill says of their search of an inquiry. Gill, a famous commentator on the scripture, says of their inquiry that it consisted, and I quote, in the use of the means of grace, by prayer and supplication, by reading the prophecies that went before, by observing the types and shadows and sacrifices of the law, and waiting upon the Lord for the inspiration of his spirit. So their search and inquiry was not just in the Holy Spirit, but it was also a searching into the writings which had come before them. 
It is that connection between the Spirit's promptings and the writings that is so vital for us to understand. The Holy Spirit had moved upon the hearts and minds of these men, and they indicated when God would fulfill his promises. And God told them, as Hebrews says, in various times and various ways, over and over again, that he would accomplish a great salvation by sending a deliverance that Israel needed, by sending the Messiah, that is the Christ. Their search and inquiry, however, which was through the Holy Spirit, did not end with them. But rather, these prophets, they wrote what they heard. And that has become for us the written word of God. I would encourage you to think about this as you move forward and seek to establish an identity of being a lover and a reader of God's word. That what you have in your hand is a direct connection between the things Daniel wrote and the things that Isaiah wrote. And you have a copy of the letters that they wanted you to have a copy. One of my mentors years ago, he asked me to to spend just a moment or two thinking about meeting Daniel. Now this is speculative. But upon meeting Daniel, would you want to meet Daniel? And Daniel asked, did you get my, did you get my letter? I wrote, I wrote it for you. Did you see who I was? Did you hear? And what my mentor was encouraging me to do is to recognize that these are not dead letters written by anonymous people. These were the prophets who prophesied. They searched and inquired what, what spirit or what time or season the spirit of Christ within them was foretelling. And they wrote what we have in our Bible. That's what it means for us to value what is in the scriptures. In fact, our understanding of the link between the voice of God and the writings which we have, understanding that link was of such importance to Peter, who wrote 1 Peter, that he reiterated this same idea in the very first chapter of his second epistle, 2 Peter. He says this in 2 Peter verse, uh, chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. He says, Know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Do you see that link? Men spoke from God, and in the prior verse, no prophecy of Scripture. What Peter is saying is that the Holy Spirit moved upon the hearts of the prophets, they heard God's voice, and they wrote God's word. And that is what God has done for us in giving us the word of God. God didn't just speak to the prophets about the Messiah, but he also revealed to them his amazing plan to use their writings to serve a future generation. Returning back to 1 Peter 1, verse 12, Peter says it was revealed to them, the prophets, that they were serving not themselves, but you, in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. If we capture what Peter is saying, it's absolutely stunning. The Holy Spirit did not just inspire the prophets to correctly hear from God about when the Christ would arrive, but they also understood that they were participating in the great mission of God to declare eventually the coming of the Christ and the announcement of the gospel, forgiveness of sins, resurrection from the dead, and eternal salvation. Now that the Christ has come, however, Peter says, that the things which they wrote have also been announced to you by, the Holy, by those who preached to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. So the prophetic word has been married to the apostolic preaching, which is what we have in the Old Testament and the New Testament. This is the good news, which was an eternal mystery, as Peter says, a mystery so marvelous of how God would finally accomplish redemption for his people that the angels were longing to look into these things. I love that scene in Isaiah 6, where Isaiah, a prophet moved by the Holy Spirit, had a vision of what was going on in heaven. And the seraphim are standing in the throne room of God. And the glory of God is so amazing It's so blinding to them that they cover their eyes and they cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, Lord God of hosts. Peter's saying, these are the things of God that the the angels have longed to look into. 
Now at finally long last, we can answer this first question. What is it that we have in the word of God? In the word of God, we have nothing less than the very voice of God speaking about the salvation that he has accomplished and is still performing through Jesus Christ. Hear how theologian John Frame puts this, describing the voice of God. He says that Jesus gave to the disciples and the apostles gave to the church words revealed by God, words by which we live and die, live or die. Where are those words to be found? Is it too much to expect that, as with the Old Testament, the New Testament words of life would be located in a book? God has shown us that he likes nothing uh, better. He likes to speak to human beings through written words. He prefers, indeed, not to speak to each person individually, though he is quite capable of doing that, but rather to speak publicly, to spread his speech out on the public record so that all alike can come and see. He prefers to place his words in a written constitution so that a people can be formed, a body of individuals, visibly and externally, as well as invisibly and internally, united and governed by their allegiance to a particular text. Here's the key point. Frame says, and he speaks through that text with the same authority as the divine voice itself. So many Christians are running around wanting to hear from God directly, and they never want to open their Bibles. I did an experiment. I would not encourage this experiment, but I'll tell it. I did it for you, so you don't have to do it. I spent the last week just watching little Facebook reels of popular sermons that are, or, or snippets of messages that are captivating the minds of many Christians today, and what I heard and saw appalled me. It appalled me because these people were constantly encouraging people to hear from God, but no one advocated for opening their Bibles. No one. Like I said, I don't encourage you to go on that journey. You don't have to go watch this, the sermons on Instagram and Facebook. I did it for you. This is what we have, brothers and sisters, of the eternal value that comes to us through God's word. We have nothing less than the voice of God speaking to us today in a way that we do not have to discern or divine on our own privately, but rather we can come to with all the limits of our understanding and we can open and read and he speaks, illumining it by his Holy Spirit to us today. Understanding that value that we just explored is why I said at the beginning that we have to come to an understanding of what we have in the word of God if we are to be motivated for any long sustained developing of a habit of reading God's word. This brings us to our second and final big question. We already heard what is it that we have in the word of God and now we turn to what is it that we are doing when we read God's word. Well, knowing what we have in the writings of the prophets and the apostles concerning the grace of God that is for us, we hear Peter say in verse 13 what we should do in response. He says, therefore, understanding what I just wrote, therefore, prepare your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. By preparing your minds for action, I believe that Peter commands us to join into the labor of the church, the prophets and the apostles described ab above. If the prophets searched and inquired diligently in the scriptures and in the spirit, how much more should we take advantage of the full writings? If the prophets searched about when the Messiah should arrive, how is it that we who know the Messiah has arrived should ignore what they wrote? No, rather, we must equip our minds to be ready to act. If, as Peter says, angels long to look into these things, should we be content that we have a Bible, perhaps on every shelf in our home, and yet not allow it to be open? Should we be content if our Bibles remain closed, yet the angels were wanting to look into the things of God? May it never be. In the light of the prophets and the apostles, Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you means to become so saturated with God's word to become cemented in the knowledge of the truth. So what is it that we are doing when we read God's word? We are hearing the voice of God concerning how we should conduct ourselves 
so that our hope is firm, firmly and immovably set on his grace. That is how you and I can individually glorify God every day in reading our Bibles. Not just by seeing the beauty of God's deliverance in history once, but by becoming ready to act accordingly. Remember, Peter said, therefore, prepare your minds for action. Set your hope fully on the grace. I'm convinced that one of the reasons why many people do not see the value of developing a personal devotional habit of reading God's word and praying from his word to him every day is because they unfortunately think that the private devotion time or, or the quiet time as it's often uh, discussed is, is really just for their own individual edification. Now, brothers and sisters, don't hear, uh, don't hear me the wrong way. It is a wonderful thing. You are edified, you are strengthened directly from the word. But the word that you read is not just an emotional, feel-good, kickstart your day. You are being trained by seeing how God has acted faithfully in history of how to act in the future. You do not do your personal and private devotions for your own individual benefit. Rather, what you are supposed to do when you read God's word regularly and often is to be so transformed by what you read so that you can transform the world that is around you. The need for the hour in our culture today is men and women who are so familiar with the stories of God's deliverance, so captivated by the rehearsal of what they've heard God do time and again faithfully by his strong and outstretched arm, that they are able to withstand the great evils and persecutions of our day and summon an even greater faith that the saints throughout the ages have done. That's why we've been given the scriptures. Paul says to the Corinthians, these things were written down for our instructions. He says the same thing to the Romans in his epistle to the Romans. He thinks these things were written for an example for us. We are to be trained by story after story. Imagine this, trying to withstand the wokeism of our day and never having understood how Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow to the idol when they were commanded at point of death if they should not bow. What did they do? Perhaps you remember the story. They said, our God is able to deliver us from the fire, but even if he doesn't, we will not bow. You, brothers and sisters, your souls must be strengthened with such stories. You see, God has not given us our, his word just to proclaim about Christ in the Old Testament, but Christians in the Old Testament. All of Christ, all of life, all of God's word applies to what we need in our day. So to rehearse, what is it that we have in God's word? We have nothing less than the very writings of the prophets and the apostles who heard from God and wrote what we need to hear from God. And what are we doing? We're preparing our minds for action. What we do in our personal private reading does not end there, but carries on and informs how we live our lives. So, with all of that high-minded theology in mind, with all of that grand, glorious vision, how do we flesh this out? Well, I want to give you some practical instruction on how I think Peter intends for us to obey his command to prepare our minds for action and to set your hope fully on the grace. Before I, I go forward with practical matters, I want to address two common myths that many people have. R.C. Sproul, in his very short, wonderful book called Knowing Scripture, he actually begins with these two. So just cards on the table. I've stolen this from Sproul. But I thought that they were such valuable uh, objections to address that it would be, it would be helpful for you. First, the, the most common objection is that Scripture is too difficult to understand. Now, this objection has, at first, some merit. It is true that the scriptures do contain difficult material to, to understand. In fact, some of the most difficult material is in the prophets proper. Uh, think about Daniel and the lion. The le it's a lion, a leopard. I forget exactly. It's a very confusing prophecy. Many Christians, when they encounter such things, they get trapped up. 
I love what Pastor Foster did uh, the last few weeks where he said, when, when you read something that's confusing in the scripture, you say, hmm, that's weird, and you move on. That is a, so, it's so honest, and it's so true. That's what we, we need to do. But while this objection is somewhat correct, there are strange, confusing things in the Bible, that objection proves too much. Here's what the confession of faith says. All things in scripture are not alike plain in themselves, nor alike clear unto all. Yet those things which are necessary to be known, believed, and observed for salvation are so clearly propounded and opened in some place of scripture or other that not only the learned, but here, here's the promise for us, but the unlearned in a due use of ordinary means may attain to a sufficient understanding. You do not have to become a scholar to understand the Bible. I want to encourage you. You do not have to become a scholar to understand what you need to understand from the Bible. The scriptures as a whole are not too difficult to understand, but as the confession says, a due use of the ordinary means. That just means that you are using what you have at your disposal. The intellect you have, the time you have, the books you have. You can make a good use of the ordinary means and you can come to not a complete understanding, a sufficient understanding. This is so helpful. It so relieves the burden that we often feel while reading our Bible that we have to understand everything that we are reading. You can do it. The Holy Spirit will illumine God's word and you can ask, through, uh, you can ask God for help through prayer and move forward. Some things I will encourage you are only understood years and years later after you read them. That's the first objection. The scripture is too difficult to understand. The next objection is somewhat similar, but it's different, that the Bible is boring and irrelevant. Now, this objection is only made by those who I believe are truly carnal. That is to say, those who have no interest in the things of God do not find anything valuable in the scriptures of God. That's okay. But for those who are truly the children of God, if you do not find the Bible anything other than boring, would I, I would submit to you that you have not begun to enter into the Bible. So many people don't see how the Bible is relevant to their world, but they think that they can immediately apply it to their world without first entering the world of the Bible. What do I mean by that? I mean to begin to read in such a way as you become captivated with the stories you become captivated with the stories and you hear God's word speaking to you. The Bible is an amazing book. It's filled with intrigue, drama, friendship, betrayal, stories of heroes, evil villains. It's, it's filled with kingdoms rising, kingdoms being destroyed, words of warning, the law, encouragement, poetry. Its words will take you to the heights of heavens and bring you in humility down to the dirt in showing you your sin. The Bible isn't boring, you're boring. Now I mean that in humility. But seriously, the Bible is a stunning book and the Holy Spirit, if you pray as you read, he will open it to you. If you are a child of God, Jesus said, my sheep, they hear my voice. You are promised you will hear God's word in the Bible. The Bible is infinitely relevant to all the situations and seasons of life, and God has not only made it relevant, but he's also made the very pursuit of its relevance as a glory for you. Listen to this. In Proverbs 25, verse 2, he says, it is the glory of God to conceal things. It's the glory of kings to search things out. What are we? We're a nation of kings and priests. It's the glory of kings, brothers and sisters, to search things out. That's what we do when we join with the prophets who searched and inquired diligently in the Spirit. There are things in the Bible which you will discover that will fulfill your life. In fact, I would even say that as if you are a Christian, unless you understand what the Bible says, you don't really even know who you are. First John says, what we are we do not even understand because when he is revealed, we will see him as he is. We'll be transformed when we apprehend and comprehend who Jesus is, and that happens in the Bible. Finally, some practical instruction. Those two objections having been dismissed and addressed, practical instruction on how to obey Peter's command to prepare our minds for action. 
Well, it follows if the prophets who prophesied were serving us, that we have something that needs to be done for us. It follows that our writing, that their writings should actually be read by us. Imagine that. And as we read, we must know these aren't just writings about the Christ, but about how we are to live as well. The salvation which was, be to, was, which was to be revealed also includes how the Holy Spirit applies that salvation to us by faith, our taking hold of that salvation and being preserved in it. So how can we set our minds or set our hope fully on the grace and prepare our minds for action? Well, I have four practical helps. First, you must become convinced that you can become a reader of God's word. Be sure that reading God's word is valuable and it's vital. That's what this sermon has been uh, attempting to do. That's been the aim of this sermon. What you have in the Bible is nothing less than the voice of God. The idea that you can become a reader of God's word is the idea of cultivating an identity-based habit. If you become familiar with God's word, you will become strong in the faith and your hope will be set fully on Christ. So understand, reading God's word is profitable and it's necessary. It's valuable and it's vital. You must be convinced that reading God's word is a daily delight and a duty. You do not need to divorce duty from delight. It is a duty and a delight. It's a daily duty and a daily delight. One of my mentors has a phrase <clears throat> that I think is extremely valuable to me. He writes books that are commentaries for pastors to be able to understand God's word. And in those commentaries, <clears throat> he says, it is the joy and the obligation of the preacher to read and apply God's word. It's the joy and the obligation. So that's the number one thing. That's the most practical thing I can encourage you to do. Become convinced that you can succeed at reading God's word. The second thing is get a translation that you will actually read. Now, we've chosen the ESV as our preaching Bible. Pastor Foster mentioned that a number of weeks ago when we started this sermon series. Uh, translations abound, and many of them are very, very good. Do not read a translation that you can't read. That's, that's my other second practical advice. The third practical advice is this. Create a very small, realistic way to get small wins. Don't go in big. Don't go in big. Don't become like the guy who signs up for the gym on January 1st and tries to bench his body weight. Don't do that. Go in small. Start humble. Begin to read a psalm. Begin to read a proverb of the day. There's many different plans. You can join the women in Same Page Summer. Uh, just for the men, you can also do Same Page Summer. You just can't attend the meetings. You can join in right wherever they are. That's the design of that system. There are tons of debates around which Bible translations and which Bible plans to read. Find a plan that works. The final, fourth, most practical thing I can encourage you to do, pick one verse from God's word about God's word and meditate on it. There are a number of different places where the scripture speaks about the value that we have in God's word. And if you meditate on those verses, you will be strengthened and encouraged to actually read God's word. So in closing, keep in mind, it is not your effort in your personal devotions in establishing these habits which keeps you, but it is the grace of God which keeps you in these things. As Peter says in verse 13, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So as those redeemed by Christ, let us set our hope fully on Christ by diligently inquiring and searching in God's holy word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the immeasurable help that we have in your written word. I ask that you would confirm your word in us, that we would learn to search and inquire in the scriptures, that we would become those who are so captivated with the stories of your covenant faithfulness, how you have rescued your people time and again, that we would be so motivated to faith and and walking in holiness that we would never turn our eyes away from you and from your word. In Christ we pray, amen.